Hi, everyone. So uh, today I'm going to go over AI fairness. Um, so talking about removing unfair bias in machine learning and um, just a quick rundown of the agenda. We have only about 25 minutes, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, but I just have a few slides to go through to give you kind of an intro to fairness and bias, um, just a few different things that we look at in the AI workflow. We're going to look at some of the metrics and algorithms and uh, some of the guidance. And then I'm going to do a short interactive demo uh, to kind of crystallize some of these concepts that I'll go through. And then I'll do a healthcare use case um, in Python. So, um, you know, the main thing that I'm going to go through today is AI Fairness 360. And um, what this is, is a comprehensive toolkit for detecting, understanding, and mitigating unwanted algorithmic bias. So, um, you know, there are several metrics, 77 metrics, 10 bias mitigation algorithms, and several metrics explainers. So, um, essentially, it's a, an extensible toolkit for detecting and removing bias or an attempt to remove bias. So just really quickly, I'm going to go into, you know, how how you measure bias, where it comes from. And so, you know, a lot of people have seen this imagery, but, um, you know, a lot of people think bias comes from your algorithm, but the underlying data is most often the source of the bias, not the algorithm itself. So this can occur due to over undersampling, uh, label bias or user generated bias. Um, models are trained on data from our past human decisions, you know, over many decades often. So this can be reflected as societal or historical inequities. So, um, you know, when we look at a selection bias where one population is overrepresented uh, or in a training data set, you know, MIT recently identified this problem with the top facial recognition software, um, you know, where they've been predominantly trained on white male data sets. So the results were 99% accurate for lighter skin male and 65% accurate for darker skin females in facial recognition. So you can imagine, you know, if law enforcement is using wide scale facial recognition, what the implications would be if you're a darker skin female. So a lot of data scientists at events um, asked me, why can't I just drop protected attributes like race, gender, age, religion? And you can't really drop these attributes um, because there are too many features that are very closely correlated. So for example, if you're looking at zip codes, um, it's very easy to deconstruct an individual's race or income. Uh, and this map just kind of shows uh, you know, when this was actually legal banks were doing this specifically to offer different amounts to credit to different racial uh, minorities. So I don't want to read all of this, but just um, so you know, there are different types of fairness terms um, that you don't typically see in, an, in a machine learning workflow. So what we'll see in the demo is things like a protected attribute. And this is something you have to define um, that partitions a population into groups whose outcomes should have parity or equality, like race, gender, uh, religion, or age. Um, there's pr privilege protected attributes. So this um, you know, could be uh, a particular group that has been historically at a, an advantage. Um, and there's two things that are, you know, change things very differently mathematically, which is group fairness and individual fairness. Uh, and we're gonna spend a lot of time looking at different fairness metrics. For some reason, my slides are, whoops, okay, slides are stuck there. Um, so just to give you, you know, there are 77 different metrics, just to give you kind of a background on a few of these. So we'll look at things like disparate impact and equal opportunity difference. These are the ways that you measure bias. So something like statistical parity difference, um, this is the difference in favorable outcomes rate uh, received by that of the unprivileged group to that of the privileged group. So if, for instance, six out of 10 uh, African-Americans had a favorable outcome rate and seven out of 10 uh, whites had a favorable rate, that difference would be uh, 10%, which would give you your measurement of bias. Um, similarly, this would be dividing those two rates and that would give you disparate impact. 
Um, and so if you're subtracting these differences in bias, you're going to want to get this as close to zero as possible. Uh, and for disparate impact, you're going to want to get this as close to one as possible. And that would indicate fairness uh, when you're measuring for bias. Um, and just so you are aware, bias can occur at any stage in the machine learning pipeline and fairness metrics and de-biasing algorithms can be performed at various stages. So it's uh, recommended to check for bias uh, as early as possible in your pipeline as you can uh, by using as many metrics as possible um, that are relevant to your application. And it, it is good to uh, integrate bias detection in your automated pipeline to ensure that you're continually correcting for bias. So you see that in the use case where after two years, there was a, a bias drift, if you will. And so, um, you know, really the type of debiasing algorithms you use will depend on where you can intervene in the pipeline. Um, you know, the best place to do this is with your data set. So if you can modify the training data, you should use the pre-processing algorithms. Um, if you can modify the learning algorithm, then you would use in-processing. And if you can only treat your learned model as a black box and can't modify the training data or learning algorithm, then only post-processing can be used. And these are just a, an example of the algorithms across the pipeline. And, you know, just so you're aware, this uh, toolkit is comprised of the top bias metrics and debiasing algorithms in the industry. They're not uh, really just an IBM thing. Really, this was about bringing a lot of the open source toolkits um, and research at universities out into the hands of data scientists in an easy, um, scalable way. So again, you know, pre-processing is the optimal time to mitigate your bias. You're going to see this um, in, in the use case. So a few things I'll use are the um, disparate impact remover uh, and reweighing. So reweighing basically changes the weights applied to training samples. Um, it doesn't change your features or labels. And so this is ideal if you can't change the values. So we'll see some of that uh, later in the presentation. So, um, you know, one of the important things to, to note is that this isn't a magic bullet. It doesn't solve all bias. So there's a trade off to this, right? Um, there is a trade off between bias and accuracy. So as you do mitigate bias, you will see a loss of prediction accuracy. So, you know, you really have to think about as an organization, as a data scientist, is your model really doing good or th bad things to people? If it's um, sending people to jail, maybe it's better to have more false positives and false negatives. Um, but if your model's handing out loans, maybe it's better to have more false negatives and false positives. So you really need to determine your threshold for accuracy versus fairness uh, based upon your legal and ethical uh, and trust guidelines. Um, and so, you know, you obviously have to do what's legal first and foremost due to penalties, um, but you have to think about what is, what does your company ethically stand for? And then, you know, we all want to go after profits as most businesses do, but, you know, what is the cost to losing trust in, uh, from your customer base? And this is just the final slide before I jump into uh, the toolkit. You know, the preventing bias, we're just starting to scratch the surface here, you know, for all tech companies. So, um, you know, we haven't really solved this problem. It's very difficult. But, you know, the, the guidance is to work with your stakeholders early to define, you know, what is fairness for your use case um, and what are the protected attributes and thresholds that you're willing to, to live with. And again, applying the earliest bias mitigation uh, in your pipeline as possible and checking for bias um, as often as possible using as many metrics that are applicable. So, you know, many people hear about the compass algorithm and, um, you know, deciding whether prisoners should go on parole or not. Um, and it, you know, it had a significant amount of bias for African-Americans, but um, they did actually try to measure and reduce or remove bias from that algorithm. Uh, but they did not use as many metrics as they needed to to discover the bias. Um, so with that, I'm just going to show you, you know, at AIFairness360.bluemix.net, this is uh, the website to the toolkit. Um, you can, you know, do things such as 
do the demos, look at some of the notebooks and look at some of the algorithms and metrics just to, to learn more. Um, up here, you'll have the API docs, which are very informative. Um, so for each sort of metric, you can look at what are the parameters, the raises, um, the methods, methods and the, the returns. So this is very um, important to understanding, you know, what you're applying and, you know, what is the equation behind that metric or algorithm. So what we're going to do here is um, just a quick demo so you can kind of visualize what we were um, talking about earlier. So what I'm going to do is uh, look at the compass algorithm, and this predicts a criminal's defendant's likelihood of reoffending. So um, like we spoke about earlier, there's protected attributes. So in this case, it's going to be sex and the privilege class is female and the unprivileged class is male. Um, you know, men are considered unprivileged in the criminal justice system and uh, may be accused more frequently than women. And then for race, the privileged class is Caucasian and unprivileged class is not Caucasian. So um, if we run this data set and we measure for bias, we'll see here that um, for the attribute, protected attribute of sex, um, you know, the prediction accuracy is 66%, but four out of five of these metrics show bias for sex. So you can see in red here, um, these metrics should be measuring much closer to zero and this should be close to one. And for race, we also see bias in four out of five of these metrics um, for statistical parity difference, equal opportunity difference, average odds difference, and disparate impact. So what I'm gonna do here is use the reweighing algorithm, and this is pre-processing. So this weights the examples in each group or label um, differently to ensure fairness before classification. But as you can see down here, there's uh, two different algorithms you could use there. Um, you could use an in-processing algorithm or uh, post-processing. But I'm going to, you know, run this model again after reweighing that data set. And what you'll see here is um, for the protected attribute of sex, the prediction accuracy was unchanged, you know, still at 66%. Uh, but what we can see here in the before and after is that the bias measurement has significantly reduced. So much closer to zero here and closer to one for disparate impact. Um, and this is the same for race as well. So we'll see um, that prediction accuracy hasn't changed much, but we have uh, reduced bias significantly across the board. So um, with that, I'm gonna just go into uh, a quick medical expenditure tutorial. And so what we're gonna do is look at how bias occurs in healthcare data and how we can mitigate it uh, with AI Fairness 360. So just to give a, an overview of this use case, health insurance companies uh, like to treat patients differently when providing managed care for things like say diabetes or um, heart disease. So they'll use algorithms to look at patients and their data to prioritize cases for care management. Um, however, in the U.S., whites utilize managed care more often than African Americans on average, and this propagates into the data set um, and into your model as bias. So, um, you know, first and foremost, so why do African Americans spend less on healthcare than whites? So there's a lot of research and data around this. Um, one of the reasons is that African Americans uh, may have jobs that don't allow them to take off um, for medical appointments, and this is even if they have health insurance. The second is that doctors often treat African-Americans with implicit bias and may not believe their patient is as sick as they're reporting to be, so less health care treatment is prescribed. And um, I don't know if you follow the news and see that, saw that Michael Bloomberg donated about $100 million to uh, black medical colleges to increase the number of black doctors. So, um, you know, the third reason is really African-Americans may not trust uh, their white doctors, so they may not trust the healthcare treatment that's prescribed. So because of those three reasons, you know, you have doctors' decisions and patients' decisions, and those two things have created bias in your data set. 
So basically, if you sh if your model shows that a particular race spends more money or less uh, and uses less healthcare services, your model will be biased in predicting how sick a patient is and whether they need managed care. So it's important to ensure that you have fairness in your model uh, and in your data set. Um, so if we go down here, this is basically uh, demonstrating bias in healthcare classification model. Uh, we build a classifier using logistic regression. Um, this notebook does random forest models, but I'm going to just um, do the logistic regression due to time. And we're going to detect bias using five different metrics. And then we're gonna do two different approaches to bias mitigation. So pre-processing as well as in-processing. And then for the data set, we're using the medical expenditure uh, panel survey. And essentially this is uh, the most complete source of data on the cost and use of healthcare uh, and health insurance coverage in the US. Um, so it's a large set uh, scale of surveys of families, uh, medical providers and uh, employers across the US. So um, the features that we're going to, the protected attribute that we're gonna focus on is the uh, race. So the privileged class will be defined as white and the unprivileged class will be defined as non-white. And there were a lot of other features in the model, um, including demographics, you know, such as age, gender, active duty status, and um, also physical mental health assessments and things like diagnosis for cancer, diabetes, and physical limitations such as cognitive hearing or vision. So the model classification task is really gonna to be to predict whether a person has or will have high utilization um, of, of health visits. So that would be greater than or equal to 10 visits uh, per year to the doctor. And that's about the average in the, in the US per year. Okay. So um, the steps that we're going to take here are we're going to um, look at three panels of data. So uh, we're going to look at panel 19, panel 20, and panel 21 of people who were continuously monitored and sampled for a year from 2014 to 2016. Um, so we'll use panel 19 for training models, panel 20 for deploying, and panel 21 for retraining um, to correct for the bias drift. So um, basically here, what we're gonna do is import the standard Python, AI Fairness 360 packages, uh, import the Lime explainers, as well as scikit-learn. And then to simulate the scenario, we're gonna split the data into train, validation, and to test set. And again, we're defining the uh, privileged and unprivileged class um, as whites and non-whites. And um, just a quick summary of the data set, there are 7,915 patients in the training set, 4749 in validation, 3166 in the test set, and there are 138 features. And again, here's the uh, protected attribute of race. But there are many, many features, as you can see here, we won't go through all of those. And so first what we're going to do is measure bias on the original data set by using the disparate impact metric. And you'll see that um, right here, the disparate impact is measured at 0.48. And this number should actually be much closer to one. So this indicates that there is bias in the original data set. So now we're gonna look at the logistic regression model on the original data. And uh, once we do that, we'll see down here that the prediction accuracy is good when we use one minus disparate impact or average odds difference. So prediction accuracy is 76%, uh, but you find that um, you know a lot of these metrics, the level of bias is too high and it should be much closer to zero. And this is just bias for the training data. So um, when we look back down at the testing data, we see that you know it's the same kind of scenario of uh, high level of bias. So the point we're just trying to make is that the original data set is unfair and hence the model we're using uh, will be unfair due to that data. So we're gonna skip through the random forest models because that's essentially the same uh, process that we went through uh, before. 
So now I'm going to apply reweighing on the original data. And it associates, uh, what this is going to do is associate a weight to each data point so that the final data set you obtain is more fair. So once you do this, um, you'll see, you know, again, we're measuring disparate impact. And after applying that algorithm, disparate impact is one. And so this is really good. This indicates that the data set is much more fair. So again, you know, just going back and training the, um, retraining the data set with that was has been reweighed uh, and we'll see that the prediction accuracy has gone from 0.77 to 0.75 and the um, level of bias has improved by an order of magnitude and that's for the train and test set as well. So again we're going to skip through the random forest part and what we're going to do is look at an in-processing technique called the prejudice remover this algorithm uh, changes the model by directly applying constraints. So again, the in-processing algorithms directly change the model itself versus pre-processing what we saw before um, changes the data. So, um, you know, when we run through this model uh, using the prejudice remover, we see that essentially prediction accuracy has gone down to, from 0.77% to 68%. Um, however, the bias has reduced um, significantly. So, you know, you really have to be careful with your approach, uh, the type of approach you, that you use, because this did impact the uh, prediction accuracy significantly. And right here is just kind of a summary of results, right? We used um, two different types of approaches on the original data, we use reweighing as well as the prejudice remover. So you can see when you go back to this notebook later, how it impacted the bias measurement and prediction accuracy. So, you know, if we want to go back and check for, um, you know, when we're satisfied with our bias mitigation, we can go back and check after a year by deploying this model on panel 20 data. So 2014 data uh, and model used in 20, uh, 2015. Um, and that when we do that, we can see that um, the bias uh, prediction accuracy went from 77 to 73%. So that's pretty good. Um, and the bias measurements here show that um, bias is still pretty good. Um, so it hasn't drifted much over one year. And, um, you know, if I, I'm going to go back to the Lyme explainers. If we now look at, um, we're going to test the model that was trained using panel 19 data on panel 21 data. So this is two years later. If we just take this model and redeploy it, we'll see here that our prediction accuracy is good. Um, but again, the bias increased over two years. So not in the first year, uh, but it, it increased during the second year. So again, we need to refresh this model with data from 2015 and again, redeploy that back out into 2016 models. So we're able to correct for that bias drift. So that's just an important thing to, to keep in mind um, that you can't just do this on the front end. You need to continuously check for bias um, uh, over time. And if I go back up into the Lime explainers and I'm getting just to the end of time here, um, you know, it's, it's important. This is uh, two different instances, um, but we're gonna visualize the explanation using the Lyme model. And just for two particular patients, um, essentially we can see that these features indicate what's important um, and their weights that contribute to whether a patient uh, requires more managed care or not. Um, so essentially, the right-hand show, side shows the actual values of the feature in the partic uh, particular instance um, and the associated weights. So these are things like chronic bronchitis, uh, smoking, pregnancy, emphysema, et cetera. So it's important to look at, um, you know, what is contributing. And, you know, oftentimes nurses may go back and do this. What is contributing to a, a model predicting whether a patient is high risk um, and requires more managed care. So um, just a quick summary of everything we've done here. I know this is uh, 
very quick, but um, essentially the original model from 2014 was very unfair when we deployed it in 2016. Um, so we retrained that model using the latest data and this uh, improved the fairness and accuracy. So again, really important to continuously check for your model um, and drift over time. Um, but also to try different approaches. You know, it's best to mitigate bias on your data set, but you may not always be able to do that. Uh, but it is important to, to use as many metrics as possible to, to ensure you're checking uh, for bias in as many different ways as you can. So with that, um, I think the last thing I might leave you with in chat um, is a few resources. So I'll put this in chat. Um, this is where you would get the demos, tutorials, and notebooks. Uh, you can join the AI Fairness 360 Slack. We have a ton of researchers and developers who will answer all sorts of questions, um, and they run very broadly across the gamut. And I also worked on a book with our researchers, and this is a free book um, by O'Reilly, who had published it, but we wrote it. This will just give you more detail around the topic, and uh, it's pretty short, so it's easy to read. And um, I'll put those in. Um, much. This was great and uh, very short, so I was just rushing through there, everything. Yeah, no, it was great, very great and very, very informative. So thank you very much. I'm sure the, all the attendees really enjoyed it here. Um, so thank you again, Tricia. Um, thank thanks everybody for, for coming. This is, that's all that we've got now. So um, I hope you enjoyed both of our speakers. I hope you enjoyed interacting with some of the other attendees. We'll, we'll be sure to get a, another event uh, like this going. And if you have some, any feedback on kind of the process or what we're doing, or if you have any ideas, uh, for talks that you would want to give or, or anybody else, go ahead to the respective meetup pages. We still have our own uh, Miami, New York, and Philly pages where you can uh, just drop a comment there or contact one of the organizers. But thank you all again for coming um, and have a good night. Bye-bye.